Welcome back, everyone, to History of Graphic Narratives. In this lecture, I'm going to talk about the modes of narrative art that are in a series. And truth be told, there are quite a few of them. What is a narrative mode that represents a series? Typically in a series, you have a group of images that are arranged in a specific order. So when it's just a group, you have no distinct order, or no clearly chosen order, and the reader moves between the various pictures, developing thematic relationships between them. Just like you might wander through an art gallery or a museum, that would be a group of images. In a series of images, there's a very specific and distinct linear direction to the pictures. And the way in which you create that series establishes a certain sense of time progression, a beginning, a middle, and end, a kind of path through a picture. It has to be specific and fairly clear. So that is a series. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about metamorphosis, progressive narratives, continuous narratives, synoptic narratives, the linear narrative, and the consequential narrative. To begin with, let's look at metamorphosis. This is a very interesting kind of series. It's a series where one picture transforms into another one. My example here is Charlie Brown's round face metamorphosizes into a football. Okay, now there's a kind of internal logic to this. Somebody's head is not a football, but when they become the football, it's like there's a sense that they always had within them this certain kind of relationship you're establishing. And this is a kind of evolutionary thing that we're describing here. So several elements visually relate to each other by few, changing a few aspects in a linear progression. So that it's going through these changes. And the changes don't have to be sensible, such as this very famous metamorphosis of King Louis Philippe into a pear. This was done by Philippon. And we'll talk more about its history and background in the lecture. But just note how we begin with a striking resemblance of King Philip, and then slowly his head becomes more and more pear-like. Now, of course, the joke here is that to be a pear is to be a fathead. And so the progression here is how the king has progressively become less and less sensible as a human being. It's a kind of way of sort of making a kind of caricature, right? That sort of distortion. But now we see the caricature distortion over time. Here's a classic example of that transformation where J.J. Granville creates sort of a classical uh, visage of a man in profile, and we see that shift and distort into a frog. Now, you couldn't imagine any two pictures so different, and yet the progression, he shows us how that shift happens over time. A number of artists have used this device of metamorphosis, uh, very famously, Windsor McKay, Dreams of a Rare Bit Fiend. He was really into this idea of animation and did a numerous, numerous animated films. And you can see the sense of transformation that's happening. And it's dreamlike. And this is sort of this idea that the, the logic it has is emotional and the sort of the earth becomes so tiny he can barely hold on to it. It's just a wonderful visual progression that he creates in his pictures. Likewise, we see Robert Crumb, the underground comic artist from the 1960s, showing us a sort of typical suburbia transform into this sort of abstract yin-yang symbol of the cosmos and then vanish into nothing. 
These are all examples of how metamorphosis can be employed in a comic format. Our next narrative strategy or mode is called a progressive narrative. In a progressive narrative, we only look at a single frame. We are not showing a series of images or we are looking at what's really like a parade where the characters are displayed in, in, in a sort of tableau or a scene and there's no repetition of characters and yet there's a clear sequence of events that is happening. So like a parade, imagine a whole lineup of characters and as we move along our eyes or we actually physically walk along to look at the picture, we are seeing different things happening. Okay, oftentimes these progressive narratives rely on markers like numbers or the alphabet that lead us through the story. So in this case here, we have Lucy holding the ball at A, Charlie Brown running B, Snoopy up on his doghouse doing a dramatic reenactment with his puppets in C, and then D we have the camera ready to catch the whole event on the fall of the fall. And so even though there's no repetition of characters, we sort of have a sense of the humor and the direction of the narrative from the way it's laid out. Classic examples of the progressive narrative are the Parthenon frieze, the sort of Panhellenic progression. This is a very famous relief carving in stone along the Parthenon in the upper area. Uh, and as you walk along the perimeter of the Parthenon, you see this parade. And the parade is all of the people bringing offerings to the temple of Athena. A more contemporary rendition of this idea of the progressive narrative can be found in Rube Goldberg's hilarious machines, which are absurd and preposterous. And here this man is just simply trying to remember to mail his wife's letter. And this whole mechanism strapped to his waist is there to lend his memory and aid. And so this is kind of the way in which Rube Goldberg is kind of playing with our ideas about what it takes for human beings to become dependent on machines. The next narrative mode I want to talk about is the continuous narrative. The continuous narrative is also like a long strip, but in this case now we have a repetition of characters. We can show that one character going through a series of episodes in their lives which lead them to their inevitable conclusion. So there's a path that we're following and we see this person, this one person, walking along this path throughout this, uh, their journey. And there would be a kind of continuous landscape kind of linking them together. So in this case here, we see Charlie Brown uh, failing, kicking the football when he's young, and then again practicing and practicing and practicing, and yet in the end, ultimately failing. And so this idea of a continuous effort is a great way to, to be depicted in a continuous narrative. Famous examples of this continuous narrative format can be found on the Bayou Tapestry, which is almost 230 feet long, and it is the unfolding story of the Battle of Hastings, where the, uh, the British were defeated. And uh, we see here the people uh, pointing up into the sky to the extraordinary arrival of Halley's Comet. Other people have taken on this idea of the progressive narrative, and this is the story of Bonaparte told in stick figures, taking this idea of a mighty and dramatic adventure and, and making it seem ludicrous and, and superficial by rendering it in this kind of doodle-like format. So here we have the progress of Boney. But of course, it's not a progressive bo narrative. It is, in fact, a continuous narrative. Very 
rarely do you see continuous narratives in comics. Here's one contemporary example from Alan Moore. You probably know Alan Moore from his famous work in Watchmen and V for Vendetta, uh, one of his other comics called Promethea, one of my favorites. We see the life of the, the Promethea unfolding as a deck of tarot cards in a continuous narrative. Synoptic narratives. This is a continuous narrative, but instead of being a kind of long path through a long landscape, suggesting this idea of a kind of challenge or epic effort, a synoptic narrative is a single panel that we look at all at once. And in this case, uh, the characters can kind of fold around. So we see Lucy enticing Charlie Brown, Charlie Brown saying again, I can't believe it. And then him trying to kick the ball and failing and falling on his back. So this, the images are all together, but we may kind of wander around the picture. It does require some knowledge of the story to make sense of it, but every part of the story is essentially there. This is not an, an epic more than an aphorism, a kind of moral tale. And we see a lot of this in Christian representations. This one from the early Renaissance by Masaccio, the tribute money. In this picture, we look first to Christ, who is being ordered by the tax collector. Christ directs Peter to go to the river and get the money from the fish. And then you see on the left, and then you see him again on the right, um, giving the money to the tax collector. So the tax collector is represented twice, and Peter is represented three times. One first center, then off to the left, then off to the right. And this is all a kind of moral tale about what is due God and the resources that he gives freely. Here's another example of a synoptic narrative. It is a picture of a bedroom where Charlotte Solomon's mother is uh, in bed rest under deep depression and she, her, her nurse leaves. She gets up from the bed, opens the window and jumps out. And so this very really dramatic move where we see her in the window small and then the window looms large and we see her foot over the edge of the sill. Linear narratives are one of the earliest sort of narrative stories that we have that kind of lead us to this idea of the modern comic. A linear narrative is just a series of episodes from a story that link up typically in a thematic way. The order of the images is not important as important in a linear narrative, it's more important that they're all there. So if I were to make a linear narrative of this story of Charlie Brown, I would call it the 12 failures of Charlie Brown. And here we see him failing 12 times at trying to kick the football. And so these are independent episodes with repetition of characters. And the idea is we see 12 times he's failed at trying to kick the football, each one kind of different, but all together fairly similar. Similarly, we see this idea of a linear narrative um, in classical times, this idea of the Zeus Temple Olympia, the story of Hercules. And we see Hercules here in a series of episodes and trials uh, where he is uh, set to beat these monsters and demons under the guidance of Athena. We also saw this earlier in the tortures of St. Erasmus, these sort of 12 episodes from the um, penitent sufferings of this saint. Lastly, I want to talk about a narrative that is something that needed to be kind of invented. It's this sort of middle narrative strategy that lies between the linear narrative of the past and the modern narrative of most comics. The consequential narrative is a series of images which are linked together together 
through some kind of causal idea that because of this, this happened, and because of this, this happened. Now, the amount of time between these episodes is kind of spread out. So these are what we call linked scenes over a long period of time with repetition of characters. So you have characters appearing over throughout their life. We have Charlie Brown as a young kid, not being so happy, then his encounters with Lucy and his failure to kick the football. And there we see him in middle age talking to Lucy as his therapist. In this way, we see the arc of somebody's life as a kind of moral tale. And this was a, a strategy that was developed in narrative storytelling by William Hogarth. He really invented this. These are consequential narratives. He didn't call them this. He just called them picture stories. I'm using the word consequential narratives to just sort of distinguish it from modern comics and from the narratives of the past. This is a really original narrative strategy that we'll talk about more in our next lecture.